Very good. Can you all hear me? Great. Thank you. Well, well, thank you for having me today. I cannot believe people are still in this room. It's unbelievable. You, did, did you all really start at 9 o'clock this morning? Unbelievable. Anyway, um, <laughs> you all are dedicated, and it's nice to see you all here, and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, and thanks to, to all those who organized this workshop. Um, but I want to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking about is patient-centered care. I'm a psychologist by training. I'm at Johns Hopkins with Doug Kerr and Dr. Kaplan and some of these other characters who have been entertaining you today. And um, I'll try to keep my end up as well. Um, so I want to tell you a little story. Doug knows that. We're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about today is I want you to know as patients and the physicians and others in the rooms who don't know about this is, you know, what's the thinking in medicine about where we need to go? And what's your job in that? And um, I want to talk about that theoretically and then talk about it very, 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 very practically, too. Because I think you need to understand what's happening, I think, in terms of how doctors are thinking. Has anybody read this book yet, How Doctors Think? Really interesting book, worth reading. Um, a little scary, but worth reading. But we're going to talk about some of the challenges in healthcare and what we can do about that. And I have a lot of colleagues and friends who have helped me. Um, think about this. Most of what I want to talk to you today about is what I learned from, from people who have condi chronic conditions. I work in rehab with people who have chronic pain, TM, spinal cord injury, amputations, strokes, all that kind of thing. And so a lot of what I'm talking about today is what I learned from those people. Um, the guy who really got me thinking about this was this guy here. Um, has anybody heard me speak before? You haven't? You have. You know about this story? No, okay. This is the guy that got me thinking about this. I'm actually going to go see him um, in a month. And this is a guy, this is a picture I took of him in a bar in Ireland. Not surprising, he's in a bar in Ireland. And um, at the time I was doing a lot of work, in, this is 20 years ago. Um, and he, I was doing a lot of work at the time in arthritis. And um, if you are a clinician, in the crowd. Just take a good look at this picture and you should be able to tell me what kind of illness he has. Um, so let the doctors think, and nurses and people think about that for a few minutes. Well, this guy, I ran into him into a bar in Ireland. He's in there and he's drinking and he, because of his illness, he had to quit his work. He worked as a stevedore loading the ships in the port in Dublin. Dublin's a, the major port in Ireland, major port in Europe. And he had to quit, retire from his work because his illness was so bad. And because of that, he kind of was, he considered himself a young man. And he wanted to do something else. So he ended up founding a program, an educational program on the waterfront where kids would come down from the schools and he would do tours of the waterfront to talk about the history of the Dublin Harbor and how people, you know, how the whole sea industry works and how this whole thing started. And it got him basically started on his second career in his life at the age of about, I think when I took this picture of him, he was 61. And he's still doing that. He just retired last year at 82. Somebody else has taken over the program. And he told me, and Dr. Kaplan I know was talking earlier today about benefit finding, this idea that when something bad happens to you, it can be a good thing. Okay, are there, or when something bad happens, is it all bad? That there are, that life is a mixture of events? Well, this guy got me thinking about the fact that, boy, when we start talking to people about what their conditions are, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is wrong with them. And no one ever asks them, well, what's going right for you? Or what strengths do you have? Or what skills, what knowledge, what ability do you bring to this problem? And he got me thinking about this whole idea. And those of us who want to have more conversation about this, I think we have a scheduled discussion later on this evening, which I can't believe either, but later on this evening on growing in the face of adversity. So if some of us are interested in that, are going to sit around and talk about that. I invite you to that conversation. But this guy got me really thinking about this whole idea that things, there's a lot that people can do and there's a lot of opportunities here if we take, and take a little step of reflection. And that really, when I started thinking about this, the healthcare team was not 
using patients very well. That is, we were doing a lot of things to people as opposed to working with them. And what this talk is about working with people. Why do we need to do this? Because the healthcare situation is changing very dramatically. Oops, sorry. Healthcare models are changing, the problems of healthcare are changing, and we begin to recognize the fact that people's health is not just biological, it is psychological and it is social. And if you don't address all those things, you're not going to help very many people. And we need to recognize because of these first three things, there is increasing demands on patients and their families. We'll talk more about that in a second. So changing healthcare models. The fact of the matter is, traditionally, what healthcare focused on was pathology. What is wrong with you? Okay? And TM is the perfect example is, we can tell you exactly what is wrong with you. And we can't do a hell of a lot about it. <laughs> now, we're hopeful things are changing. There are things we can do to maintain function and so forth and improve the quality of life. But it's not like if we know what's wrong, we're going to fix it. A lot of the conditions we're dealing with now in healthcare are not things we fix. Let's pick the biggest healthcare problem facing our country. That would be diabetes. Okay, the, the most expensive healthcare problem we have right now is will soon be diabetes. We will overtake heart disease very, very shortly. We can tell you we have diabetes, but that doesn't fix the problem, does it? There are things we can do to manage diabetes. So people don't die or lose their leg or lose their eyesight, but it's not a fixable problem. But the focus on pathology was a good thing. It helped us understand what's wrong with people. The problem is, is that it caused us to, to focus for a very long time just on how are we going to cure this, which is something we need to work on. But what are we going to do while we're working on cures? Okay, We've been, and the problem was, is that we were so successful for so long. We don't think about polio, do we anymore? You know, when, I, when some of us were young growing up, we were coming in just at the beginning, end of the polio scare. We don't think about polio anymore. We don't think about measles. We don't think about people dying from these illnesses because we have them under control. And that works, and that's very powerful work, but it doesn't deal with all the healthcare problems we're dealing with nowadays. The problem with taking only a cure-based approach, which is important, but only half the story, is it says, well, just sit there, we'll get back to you, we have something to do to you. Well, that doesn't work, okay? It also reduces the fact, reduces the importance of the relationship between the physician, the nurse, the therapist, and patient. And so that's not really important. All it's important is what we stick into you. And that's not true either. Okay? And the other thing is, it says, well, if you have an illness, if you have a disability, there's something wrong with you, and we're going to focus on what's wrong with you. And I would argue that is the wrong focus. That is, disability is not inability. Just because a person has an illness does not make them a sick person. Okay, the other issue here is the healthcare problems are changing, as I've alluded to. The big money in healthcare now is in chronic conditions. That's where the money is. Okay, if you look at the top three most expensive things going on, they're all chronic conditions. They are not things we are going to cure in the short run. And the fact is, people are living with disability longer and Patients are having to manage these problems for a lot longer time. The problem is we have huge resources invested in the acute care business. If you get whacked on the way home, we're going to send a helicopter for you. We're going to scrape you out of the car. We're going to fly you to the level one tra shock trauma center. We're going to run up a bill of probably right around $250,000 to save your life. We're going to take care of you, and then we're going to send you home. But we're not going to give you any therapy in your house. We're not going to build a ramp for you. We're not going to pay for a wheelchair except for one every three or four years. This is like craziness. <laughs> I'm not saying we shouldn't save people's lives, but if we're going to save their life, let's make life worth living. <sighs> Our health care system is all built around acute care. 
nothing about chronic care. This is a big problem in our country, which we're just beginning to think about. The problem here to is, is that while people like Dr. Kerr, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Pitcock, they work long hours. I mean, they work 50, 60 hours a week. But the issue is, who is doing the real work of health care? Who does most of the work on health care? Who? Nurses. Nurses. They, work, they think they work hard. Yeah. Who? Yourself. Yourself and the family. There's a lot of work to be done here. You got the direct illness work. You got to find a doctor. You got to make an appointment. You got to deal with the insurance company. You got to take care of managed care. You got to figure out can you get in? Is the place wheelchair accessible? Maybe it's not. You got to do the own the psychological work. You got to refigure re out who you are, and you got the everyday life work. It used used to get up, get showered, get out of the house in a half hour. Now that takes two and a half hours. <laughs> this is work. There's a lot of work. A lot of work. There's a lot of work to do, but the work is invisible. No one pays attention to it except for you and your family. Right? People don't want to help you with it. It's, and no one teaches you how to do it. You kind of pick it up along the way somehow, or a website, or come to a meeting. But the patients and families are the central workers of health care. If, if any of you all are TV watchers, you, you know, of course, that we're on TV now. I don't know if you've seen, you've seen, have you seen any of us on TV on Hopkins 24-7 on Thursday nights at 10 o'clock on ABC? A couple of us have passed through those, have passed through the, I was in a shot for like a, that long of the night. I mean, it was literally that long. <laughs> they don't care, they're not interested in rehab. They want to look about people getting gunshot wounds and having their brain tumors. They don't want to see the real work of health care because what is that? It's not very glamorous. Person going to PT week, day after day, week after week, working out, dealing with it. That's not, there's not much good TV in that. We never get on these 20, hop 24-7. But the fact of the matter is only patients and their families work 24-7. The doctors go home. They, they do get off. Even the residents can't work more than 80 hours a week. We don't, they're not allowed to do that anymore. So sometimes you feel like this dinosaur here. The picture is pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climate is changing. The mammals are taking over. And we have the brain about the size of a walnut. I mean, these guys <laughs> recognize. So sometimes those of us who are the chronic condition business think like we're like the dinosaurs. No one, we're like, no one, we're, we're going to lose out here. But I think there are things that we can do. We need to change how we take care of people. We need to change our health care models. We need to change our research. We're not talking about research today. But how do we respond to this whole thing? OK? There are several things we need to do. Is we need to realize that patients and families are the central workers, and we need to help them do that. I spent a lot of time training doctors and nurses trying to get this into their mind. The patients and the families are doing all the work. Your job is to help them do what they have to do. Okay. The other point here is that we need to realize is that people are very resilient. They will bounce back and do bounce back. How can I figure out what this person's strengths are and build on those? As opposed to also telling them always what's wrong with them. You know? The doctor asks all these questions, you know, are you sleeping, are you crying, do you want to kill yourself, okay, I'm not depressed. But no one says, well, that's great, you're really doing a great job. They say, okay, now on to the next, let me ask you some more questions, find out something else that is wrong with you. No one wants to talk about what you're doing right, that's not very interesting, because we can't get paid for that. Of course, you can't get paid unless you have a diagnosis. There's no diagnosis with patient doing well, that's not, there's no diagnosis there. One of the solutions to this problem is patient-centered care. Has anybody ever heard of patient-centered care? You've heard about it, but you don't know about it. This comes out of a report by the Institute of Medicine called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And you all have heard about this. Who heard about the report that came out about a year and a half ago that said American medicine is killing 275,000 people per year? Anybody hear that? In the, above the fold, New York Times. This is the one that said, this is the report that said people are getting the wrong medicine, they're having the wrong leg cut off, they're getting uh, misdiagnosed, and 275,000 a year are dying because of safety issues, right? 
this, that's the thing that everyone talked about. These people said there are six things to do to fix American medicine. One of them was safety. That's the only one we heard about. The number two thing was patient-centered care. What we mean by that is saying that patients should be in charge of their care. The first thing you should do if you're a physician to say is, what is your biggest problem and how can I help you with it? That should be the way beginning all consultation, medical consultations begin. What brought you here today? What's your biggest problem? And then shutting up and listening. We have a big problem of p providers not listening to patients. Do you know how long it takes? You guys can answer this question. We've done these studies at Hopkins. From the time a patient comes in the office and, and, the, pa and the physician or nurse says, well, you know, what brings you here? How long is it before they start talking on average? So do you want to guess? Four and a half seconds. 17 seconds. One second. It's not quite that bad, but it is measured. It's, it's within a minute and a half. Within a minute and a half, the healthcare care provider will interrupt the patient and start going down some road. That is not patient-centered care. <laughs> OK? What we need to think about in American medicine is empowering patients to be participants in their own care and to activate them to do this work. So patient-centered care is about these things, respecting patients' values, what's important to them. What American medicine should be about is coordinating care for people, linking them up to home care services, PT services, activity programs, wellness clinics that we should be focusing on their physical comfort, their emotional support, and involving their family and friends in their care. This is obviously an ideal, not reality. You know, so basically, American medicine is discovering what patients have known all along. You know, people are being promoted to full professor who are writing these books. But you guys have known this for a long time. You know, these guys are saying, for crying out loud, gentlemen, that's us. Someone installed the one-way mirror backward. These guys are doing a, are doing a scientific study of the, uh, of the, of the primates. So <laughs> the fact of the matter is patients have known this for a while. The rest of us are just kind of catching up to where you all are. So it, it, this is the hopeful news. This is the big news I'm bringing you today is American medicine is beginning to catch up to where the patients are. And that is great. Because this was in the New England Journal in 2007. Okay? That's how big a news it was in medicine. But this is how we should be practicing. Okay? This, I think, is tremendous progress for those of you all who are in the trenches. So, I'm going to skip these and go right to the meat of the matter. So what a lot of organizations are doing is developing self-management programs for people with different kinds of health problems. That is teaching you to do the work you have to do. So we have one for arthritis. There's one for arthritis. You may know the arthritis self-help program. There's one there. We have one for amputees that we've developed. We have one going on here. I apologize. This slide is very, very complex. We have one now. We're just rolling out for trauma survivors. That is, if you get hit with a car, this is going to be available to you. We're going to work with the TM Association over this next coming year to tie in the, the TM Association into a program like this. And what this allows you to do is to go online and hook up to other people who have a similar kind of condition, which you guys already have going on. And we're going to put into this what we call the Next Steps program, which is teaching people to manage their condition, the skills you need to know to manage your condition how to talk to your doctor, how to manage depression, how to manage anxiety, how to um, assert yourself with the insurance company, how to manage pain. These are all modules in this program. We're beginning to roll this out now, and hopefully over the next year in partnership with the TMA, we're going to roll one out for you all online. So we're, we're really excited about this. We think it's going to be a cool thing. So we think by the, hopefully this time next year, we'll have a program, which will be very exciting. I think. So you'll be hearing more about that so over the coming year. So what I want to end up here talking about is the fact that what treatment should be about is not just fixing what is broken in people, but it's nurturing what is best. 
That is, you should be looking for aligning yourself with people, both in terms of your own personal support network, but also with physicians, other providers, who see you as more than a condition. And understand what your personal goals are. What would make a difference to you in terms of getting better? What does being better mean for you? It's not as simple as just walking or just being able to use my hands better. There are, sometimes that goal is not the only goal that needs to be worked towards. This guy goes by Mike, by the way, as you can might imagine. Um, okay. So how do you become an effective self-manager? I'm going to end up, I'm going to take uh, two more minutes and finish up with these slides. The very first thing is to realize is, and this is a little bit depressing, but I don't know any other way to say it, is basically your health is your responsibility. That's what it comes down to. A physician, a nurse, a social worker, a PT, whoever you have working with you, that's great. But really, this problem is your problem. That's just the reality. With, and what that, with, with that comes responsibility, but also comes with that authority. That is, if you don't have people, physicians and others who are working with you, who listen to what's important to you, fire them and get someone else. Because ultimately, they're going home to their house, and you're going home to your house. And if they aren't doing what they want them to do, and if there's physicians in the room, just close your ears, is a physician is basically a plumber. You call a plumber, he comes to the house. If he doesn't listen to you and go into the right room and put, do what you want him to do, you get another plumber. That's not to say a doctor can't always fix everything you want fixed, but do they listen to you? Are you setting the priorities of treatment? This is what has to be the case. You need, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you need to get education and training. If you're going to do the work of a patient, you've got to get trained. You all are getting trained here. You need to have some short-term and long-term goals. Any patient who cannot tell me, what are you working on in the short run, and what do you want to do long run, is in deep trouble. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't want to be in a situation where you're saying is, well, long run, I want to be this, and I have nothing in the short run I'm working on. Long run, I want to be able to walk. I want to be able to get back to work, whatever. But what are you doing? What are you working on this week? Everyone's got to have these goals. You have no life. Okay? You need to know what your strengths and abilities are. I'm seeing a patient. I'll say, okay, you have these problems. I say, what do you have going for you? Somebody who can't tell me what they have going for them, they're in deep trouble. So you should have a list to yourself in terms of, you have a list of your medicines, you've got to have a list of your strengths as well, somewhere. You need to advocate and have a purpose. So, Bob, do you think I'm sinking? Be honest. <laughs> okay, so you need to take a look at, your, at yourself and say, okay, am I doing those things? Do, am I taking responsibility? Do I have a purpose? Am I building a support team? Do I know what my strengths are? Am I getting education and training? If you aren't doing those things, you aren't doing what you need to do to get better and live the kind of life you want to live. Getting better is not about taking medicine or waiting for Doug Kerr to get the rats going doing the right thing. That's not getting better. That's not going to do it. So let me just skip some of these word slides and talk about one. Let me just, um, if, if to the physicians in the crowds, if we have, or the clinicians in the crowd, and, this, and also for the patients is, every visit you go to the doctor with, as part of that time should be learning something about what's going on with you and, and working on your plan, okay? In my view, getting comfortable is the number one priority. If you're, not, if you're not comfortable, if you're in excruciating pain, it's very difficult to work on anything else. To me, it always goes right to the top of the list. Pain management has got to be number one. You can't, if, you don't, if you're in pain, you can't do anything else. Okay? And you as a patient, and also those of us who are clinicians, have to be willing to say, okay, what's going on with you emotionally? And you need to recognize in yourself where your own emotional temperature is, if necessary, do something about that, and a portion 
of this. If you don't even take any notes if you don't want to, I should have said this. I want to put my email address up. You want these slides? I'll send them all to you. Just, I'll just whack them right to you, okay? Or I won't, but somebody will. Just, I'll put up my slides in a minute. Okay? You should bring your family and friends to the visit. If you have a provider who doesn't want your family or friend come in with you, you need another doctor. Just that simple. You've got to bring other people with you. Okay? So, I'm going to talk, skip over this part about children and go to the take-home message. Sorry. So we need to recognize that patients and families do most of the work. Those of us who are health care providers ought to be supporting you. If you're not being supported in your work, get other people. I, know that makes, I don't mean to be flippant about that. I know it's hard to find good doctors. I know it's hard to find people to work with. You have to do, if you're in this room, you have a chronic health problem. You need to upgrade. <laughs> it may take you a year, but do it anyway because you're going to have this condition for more than a year probably, if you're in this room, okay? And you need to broaden your goals from fixing this problem to improving my life. Because if you're only focused on saying, I'm waiting for the cure, I'm, you're, you, you, I have a lot of concerns for you. It's just the truth. Things are moving fast. They're not going to move that fast. It's just the truth. So we need to move from a focus on the disease to creating health. That's what we need to be thinking about. So let me just, so I think about this whole thing, I'm going to end up here like gardening. I'm, I garden when I have any time to do anything, okay? My sister's a great garden. These pictures are all from her garden, okay? She's a professional gardener, but they're all from her garden. Her husband's a photographer, she's a professional gardener. But taking care of health is like gardening. If you want to get a good garden, you need to get the right tools, okay? You need to have the right tools. You need to have the right team, get the right medicines, and so forth. You got to take care of the disease as best you can. Get rid of the bugs, okay? You need to get rid of the problems. You got depression, let's take care of it. You got anxiety, let's take care of it. We got to weed things out. But really, what makes for a great garden is you need to find a healthy environment. We need to surround ourselves by things that help us grow. We need to recognize what's hardy about myself and put myself in an environment I can grow on. And then you end up with a garden like this, you know. And this is where I live, way in the back of Johns Hopkins, you know. Um, this is my email address. If you want to email me, I would be happy to um, send, you, send you slides. I'm way in the back here somewhere, right, right. Doug, he's up in this fancy space up in here somewhere. I'm way back in the back back here. <laughs> so this is my email address. I'm happy to um, uh, answer, uh, to respond to questions over the internet, or I'm also happy to send you the slides if you'd like to have the slides. Um, and I'll, we'll, we'll have an opportunity this evening to those who want to talk more about this idea of, of growing in the face of adversity. We'll have that conversation, I think, around 5.30 or something like that. So thank you very much.